Thanks for downloading Another Podcast from AnotherPodcast.com. Today's show can be found in many ways. iTunes, the AnotherPodcast.com webpage, and now can be found on Stitcher.com. You can now stream the latest show anywhere with the Stitcher app, on your computer, even on your boss's computer. Another Podcast is now at your fingertips every day of the week and at your convenience. Enjoy today's episode of Warlock Wednesdays, AnotherPodcast.com. Not a sponsor. Hello everyone and welcome to another week of Warlock Wednesdays. Not a big show for you this week, just uh, probably actually going to stay within that hour, as I always call it, the Warlock Hour, here on Warlock Wednesdays. I am your host, Razor. Uh, as I said, not a big show, but some things to talk about. Some things did go on this week in the world of entertainment. As the children return to school after summer vacation has ended, so does the football season start and the hockey preseason start. But sports is near the end, so right now I'm going to get to the topics at hand. And of course, as always, we're going to start with your comic book releases for the week. So let's get to those comic book releases, and here they are from DC. This week, we kick off the month of evil, as it is, or uh, I, I forget what they're exactly calling it, but it, it's the evil versions of the comic books. They're taking over, and it's part of the Forever Evil uh, miniseries that's going to be going on. And uh, to kick it off, Batman number 23.1 will be graced on the cover uh, by the Joker. And then we have Batman Black and White number one of a six-part miniseries. Forever Evil number one of the seven-part miniseries. Uh, And two other titles I picked from this um, month of evil for DC, Justice League number 23.1 featuring Darkseid on the cover, and Superman number 23.1 featuring Bizarro on the cover. There is many others, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, each have their own covers. I'm just waiting for the Harley cover. It's the only one I want. I'm not going to probably be reading this series per se. Uh, I'm just looking for the Harley cover, but that's not this week. It may be next week. I'll have to wait and find out. From Marvel this week, we have all new X Men number 16, Deadpool kills Deadpool number 3 of the four part miniseries, as well as Infinity number 2 of a six part miniseries, Superior Spider Man number 17, and X Men Battle of the Atom number 1 of a two part miniseries. From your independence this week, Dynamite Entertainment has Black Bat number 5. And from Image Comics, Spawn number 235, and also Witchblade number 169. That is your comic book releases for this week. Uh, At least the ones that are of interest to me or to possibly other listeners out there. Again, as always, if you would like a steady series of your comics listed on here so that you know you... You remember to go and pick them up, even if you don't have your local comic book store, putting them aside for you, as some do. I can put it on here and just send us an email over at uh, another podcast and uh, or comment, like uh, the Facebook page, the web page, anotherpodcast.com. You can comment and leave a message and tell me which comics are interest to you, and I will put them in in the show. I will even maybe expand my little five note or five limit releases just because, you know, it's something else. So with that being the end of the comic book releases, let's get right into the entertainment news and check out the box office this week. Now, as I look at the number one movie this week, I am shocked, mostly because the movie did not do well at my local theater. In fact, if I were to base this movie on my local theater alone, I would call this a box office flop. However, I am disappointed that this is movie is also number one because it tells me that there are way too many tween girls going to the movies or way too many um, fans of this band. And that means the number one movie for this week, One Direction, This Is Us. 
15.8 million people, well, or sorry, 15.8 million dollars worth of people went to see this movie. Uh, averaging out to $5,783 per screen, this movie has already sur surpassed its budget, probably even including marketing. Not that they needed it, I guess. I mean, I guess people were still going to see it. I thought number one was going to be the same movie for three weeks in a row, which actually fell to the number two spot. Lee Daniels' is The Butler falls to number two because of that British group f from across the pond, which is apparently doing very well here in North America. Lee Daniels is the butler brings in another 14.8 million dollars bringing its 3 week total up to just under 75 million dollars. Very impressive. Another impressive surprise hit of the summer, Where the Millers. Where the Millers has fallen to number 3 because of that One Direction movie and they brought in another 12.7 million dollars bringing their 4 week total to just under 110 million dollars, well surpassing its 37 million dollar budget including the unlisted marketing. Number four this week is a new film that I had to look up because I'd never heard of it before. It's called Instructions Not Included. And this movie is a Mexican film directed, acted, and written by Eugenio Derbez, or Derbe, not sure. And it was definitely a huge surprise, bringing in... 7.8 million dollars this weekend and it makes it one of the best ever showings for a foreign film now there's no big name actors in it there's very little to like as i said i had to look up the name of this movie i had to look up what this movie was about or what it was to to even say anything about it because I had not heard of it, and yet it was good enough to be the fourth spot in the top ten this week. Holding on to the fifth spot from last week is Planes with $7.75 million. Elysium is in sixth spot, actually increasing its numbers a little bit, as it was seventh last week to $6.4 million, and that's probably because of the plummeting Mortal Instruments City of Bones, which did bring in another $5.4 million, but it is kind of disappointing to see it so low at $22.9 million for its two-week total, well short of its $60 million budget, and even combining in the overseas markets, this movie is still only at $33.6 million. Um, I don't know how well the books did. Apparently they're best-selling books. But it, appear, it appears that the books were not enough. Because this movie is plummeting faster than After Earth did almost. Well, maybe not that fast. But it's going down pretty fast. And that's sad. Because the movie was actually pretty decent. And I was kind of looking forward to the sequel. I don't know if the sequel has actually been officially greenlit. I know that they were supposed to be working on City of Ashes, which is the second movie. Um, this makes it tough. This makes it a lot tougher to sell to the studios to say, well, we know we only did this much and we cost you $40 million, but let us do the sequel anyways. It's really tough to do that. Uh, the World's End falls to number 8 this week with another $5 million. And number nine is another new movie, Getaway, which, again, according to my theater, is definitely a box office flop, coming in in that ninth spot with $4.5 million, starring Ethan Hawke and Selena Gomez, did not do very well. And rounding out the top ten, Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters, $4.4 million, uh, bringing its four-week total up to $55 million, and it's also... Uh, below its budget and may not see a third movie so that is your top 10 for this week and let's check out next week release as well there is only one and uh it, it is hearkening back to its pitch black days and that's the movie riddick riddick looks more along the lines of pitch black than the chronicles of riddick which was the actual sequel to pitch black ever did this one looks more like the the actual sequel to Pitch Black, and that may make this movie 
quite more enjoyable, although the bad taste that was less, left in everybody's mouth from the uh, real sequel, the one that actually came out second, uh, will it hurt? I'm not sure. We'll have to wait and see the numbers when they come out next week. So that is it for your movie releases. Let's get into some entertainment news, and why not start with some casting news? It is official. The Rocket Raccoon has a voice. Guardians of the Galaxy and... Um, I was about to say Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers is a piece of garbage right now. Um, Marvel Studios, uh, Disney, if you will, have announced officially that James Gunn has cast Bradley Cooper to voice Rocket Raccoon. Rocket, as you know, is one of the um, more interesting characters of this. Like, I mean, there, you got a talking tree, you've got um, Gamora, you've got Drax the Destroyer, and of course you have your star um, character. So, uh, and that's... Um, played by Lee Pace, of course, and the other actors, Dave Bautista as Drax the Destroyer, Zoe Zaldana is playing Gamora, and I believe it is still, actually, it's still not confirmed, but it looks like as it's said that Vin Diesel will be doing the motion capture as well as the voice for Groot. Now, speaking of Guardians of the Galaxy, not a lot of people know Guardians of the Galaxy, so Kevin Feige has given us a brief description of what the Guardian of the Galaxies is all about. In an interview, he revealed some information about the characters. And I, I, I said Star was the name of the other character. It's Star Lord. I missed that. Uh, so I missed the Lord part. So forgive me. Um, what he goes on to say is that Thanos will be a part of it. And we'll have more than just a little bit of the smile that we saw at the end of Avengers. Uh, but here he says, Ronan the Accuser is very much the main bad guy. Thanos is lurking above it all, and you will learn more about Thanos and Guardians for sure. Certainly you'll get more than the tur one turnaround and smirk. You'll get much more than that. We've already said that Thanos plays a part in it and is a character in it. That in and of, of itself should tell you it's connected to the other worlds. Now here's the little brief descriptions. Drax the Destroyer. Drax has one goal and one goal only, which is to kill Ronan because of a past strategy. For Gamora, when we meet Gamora, she's a bad guy working with Ronan and Nebula and Korath, and by extension for Thanos. Gamora doesn't necessarily like doing that anymore and tries to find a new path for, for herself, but she has such a reputation as the deadliest woman in the galaxy that people aren't greeting her with open arms. For Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord... Uh, Peter Quill left Earth in the mid-80s, but when we meet back up with him, he's very much a citizen of the universe. Groot? Groot is a species that happens to look like trees look and is quite communicative. If you can understand the different inflections in the way he says, I am Groot. Rocket Raccoon. Rocket has been genetically and mechanically altered. He's an experiment from one part of the galaxy. And I said Lee Pace was playing um, Star-Lord. I was also incorrect on that. Just want to correct myself so that, you know, when I get texts from James or OJ, it's actually Chris Pratt who will be playing Star-Lord. Um, Dave Batista, of course, is Drax the Story still. Zoe Zaldana is still Gamora. And Vince, or Vince Diesel, Vin Diesel, I was confusing his actual name, Mark Vincent. Uh, Vin Diesel is playing Groot, prob both voice and more than likely the motion capture. And the new voice of Rocket Raccoon, Bradley Cooper. More casting news in the Marvel Universe. Not exactly Guardians of the Galaxy, but the Avengers sequel. Avengers Age of Ultron has found its Ultron. Uh, if you listen to real music, you will have already known this. And the voice actor is James Spader. James Spader will be voicing Ultron and possibly doing uh, motion capture for that as well. Now, um, if you did listen to real music, one of the uh, hosts of this network here on another podcast, James, mentioned that he was disappointed that it was not Jarvis. I did not see that as a possibility. Yes, there were rumors that Jarvis was possibly going to convert to Ultron, but it just didn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense to me. Now, that's not just to say that 
hey, just because it doesn't make sense to me doesn't mean they can't do it. I just see Ultron as something separate and different. Now, as we know, in the comics, Ultron is created by Hank Pym, a.k.a. Ant-Man. However, in this movie, it, he will be created by, it looks like, Tony Stark. Now, this has not been made official by Joss Whedon. It just makes sense that it's Tony Stark. We do have some other smart people that could create it, but it makes sense as far as the story has gone that Tony Stark's Tony Stark, sorry, would have the ego to build something that he thinks is the ultimate. Uh, maybe he starts it off as a, a suit that can do more than what we even seen in Iron Man three. Now I know a lot of people are bashing Iron Man three for some of the stuff that was used, the use of the Mandarin and the misdirection there and spoilers because there's a lot of misdirection in Iron Man 3 and it just seems to me that um, I, it just makes sense. It, it's a story that makes complete and total sense in my mind and it would definitely fit with everything that's gone on so far in the Marvel Universe. All right, maybe some uncasting news. Rumors flooded the internet earlier this week, and it was actually mentioned on Real Music uh, because they had not been yet debunked. Now, since Real Music aired, it has been debunked. So, unfortunately, Brian Cranston is not Lex Luthor. He has shot down all rumors. In fact, in a quote to Boston.com, not a sponsor. He says, six? This is all news to me, because originally it was rumored that he signed a six-picture deal to play Lex Luthor. I think that maybe my name is bandied about because I'm known to be bald. What bald guy can we get? The reality is they can take any actor and shave his head or put a bald cap on him. Casting for the film is not complete. Now, Brian Cranston did not say that he wasn't Lex Luthor. He just said he didn't sign six pictures, which will make the internet flood with more rumors that, well, he said, well, he's not signed for six. Maybe he signed for one or two or maybe a little bit less. All we can say right now is that there is other things going on. Of course, Mark Strong has said that he would like to uh, be playing the role of Lex Luthor, and others have said that he will actually reprise his role, excuse me, as Sinestro. That seems far-fetched to me in a way, because Warner Brothers has said they want to disconnect themselves from anything that comes before it. Man of Steel was supposed to be the start of their universe, the start of something that will lead to Justice League, that will lead to other movies. If you have Mark Strong come back to play Sinestro, you are automatically, by default, linking the horribleness, for most, not all, the horribleness that was Green Lantern to the um, new universe. Now, some will say that, well, there was the Green Lantern Easter egg with, um, I think her name was Carol Ferris being in it. Well, unfortunately... They didn't, or fortunately, they used a different actor. Yes, there is a Green Lantern Easter egg. That does not mean they want to associate themselves with the actual Green Lantern movie. They could cast somebody else to be Sinestro if they really wanted Sinestro in the flick. Mark Strong, to me, is by far one of the top two choices to play Lex Luthor. It should be him and Cranston, one, two. Uh, I would put Mark Strong ahead of Brian Cranston simply because he has that factor that Cranston can pull off, but I don't see it as much. People are going to expect Brian Cranston to be like his character on, um, what's the name of that show? Breaking Bad. Sorry, I just started watching it. I know, I know. People are like, what? You just started watching Breaking Bad? Yes, I'm only two episodes in. He hasn't even shaved his head yet. I was like, I thought he was supposed to be bald. But apparently that's later on. So people are going to expect that evil, diabolical man that he became throughout that series. Um, Mark Strong can play it totally different. Mark Strong can play it 
where at the end of Man of Steel, whether you liked it or hated it, and I didn't like it very much, I didn't absolutely loathe it, but I didn't like it very much, was that Metropolis was destroyed by Superman, and his fault all the way through, because even though it was the world engine and everything, they did it all because Kal-El was there. It's his fault. And that's the Mark Strong, that's the Lex Luthor that can be played. He can come in and say, look, I cleaned it all up. I made it better. I'm, I'm doing good for this city. What has Superman done? Superman's destroyed the city. Superman did this. Superman did that. It's, it's so much more a character that Mark Strong can play the good guy and then do the conniving and the evilness behind the scenes. He can do that. And that's why I would put him ahead of Cranston. Now, if Cranston gets cast, great. I think he could do it as well. I just think Mark Strong has the ability to do a lot more. And we're not even going to go with the Ben Affleck thing. You know what? Uh, I saw a meme today. Uh, I, I love seeing some memes. And uh, I saw one today that just made me laugh. And I had to share it. Uh, across the board, I shared it in on my page. I shared it on uh, my comic book groups page, and it basically says uh, it's a meme with uh, Ben Affleck in the background, and it says "F you, Internet, I'm Batman." That's it, and you know what? That's all that needs to be said, because no matter what the moaning and whining and bitching and complaining and the all the petitions in the world. No matter what, Warner Brothers has cast Ben Affleck as Batman, you either accept it or you don't. You go see the movie or you don't. Whatever, that's the way it is. So, let's move on to more casting news or potential casting news is the case for this. Fast and the Furious 7 is trying to make the final one very cool. Uh, along with all the actors that have not necessarily been confirmed, but are expected to be in it, uh, we also have Ronda Rousey from the MMA, UFC, uh, Tony Jaw, of course. Last week I mentioned that. Now it looks like Kurt Russell might be a part of it. So this is shaping up to be just like a uh, who's who of freaking action movies almost. So we'll have to wait and see if this gets confirmed or not. Treat this as a complete and total rumor. But Kurt Russell is interested. It just depends on where it fits. A uh, couple of Dumb and Dumber 2 casting uh, news. Kathleen Turner has uh, boarded the Farrelly Brothers comedy. She will be taking on the role of... Um, uh, what, 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 uh, Freda Felcher. She is the legendary hose hound from Cranston. Now, if you remember the original, uh, Felcher was the name mentioned, uh, where Harry and Lloyd are in a hot tub together, uh, and it's, it opens up past memories of a relationship for Harry, and Harry explains that he and Freda, uh, was, quote unquote, a babe who worked for the tractor company. Well, Kathleen Turner will be playing that character. Also, the does anybody remember the blind boy Billy in 4C, who bought the broken-headed parrot from them? Well, it looks like Brady Bloom or Blum, depending on how you pronounce that, will reprise his role. Twenty years, twenty some odd years later, I, I forget how long it's been since the original Dumb and Dumber came out. Uh as Billy in 4C. Now, I don't know how they're going to play it, but it is official. He is back. So two announcements for the Dumber and, Dumb and Dumber 2 uh, cast. More casting news. Fifty Shades of Grey, the popular uh, BDSM novels that were hugely popular, especially in the last couple of years, has cast not only the female lead, but the male lead. So let's go to the female lead first. Dakota Johnson will be playing Anastasia Steele in the Fifty Shades of Grey film, and her dominator, or her teacher, I'm not entirely sure, I haven't read the books, not really for me, the Christian Grey character will be played by Charlie Hunnam. 
Now, for those of you who don't know who Dakota Johnson is, I didn't really know her at first. She has played in movies that I've seen, so as I read the movies that she was in, I was like, oh, her. Well, she was in The Social Network. She's also been in uh, 21 Jump Street and The Five-Year Engagement. She's also been on the uh, Fox uh, Network's comedy series, Ben and Kate, where she obviously played Kate. So that's just to give you an indication of who she is. For those of you who don't know who Charlie Hunnam is, well, he's played in Children of Men, Cold Mountain, Nicholas Nickleby. He was in Pacific Rim. But more importantly for people who probably watch it, Sons of Anarchy. He's played in that. Uh, he was a regular on the uh, on that hit show from, I believe, FX. Again, not a sponsor. But he will be playing Christian Grey. So those are your two huge casting news for the um, Fifty Shades of Grey film. All right. Horrible Bosses 2. We have a director. And that director is Sean Anders. Sean Anders' uh, directing credits include Sex Drive. That's my boy. He's also worked alongside Morris, who did the screenplay, um, on... A couple of other movies, um, We're the Millers, which is doing very well, as we heard earlier, Hot Tub Time Machine, Mr. Popper's Penguins, and also contributed to the upcoming uh, Dumb and Dumber 2, which I also talked about earlier. So, Sean Anders will be the director for Horrible Bosses 2. Uh, He'll be... uh... Oh, he's also going to serve as an executive producer. So, eh. So, we'll have to wait and see... Where this is going for here, we we don't really know too much about Horrible Bosses 2 yet. Alright, so that's it for the movie section side of things. Let's get into the television section side of things. Just one bit of news right now, and that is Season 7 of True Blood. Season 7 of True Blood will uh, begin, obviously, not till next year, 2014. However, HBO has announced that this will be the last and final season of True Blood. I am saddened by this news, but not surprised. With the book series coming to an end, uh, earlier, I think this year, or perhaps late last year, I'm not exactly sure when the book came out, but uh, the uh, Charlene Harris has written the last, sa- last Suki Stackhouse novel. I couldn't get it out all at once. Uh, it made only sense that the series was probably coming to its end. And I mean... When you're dealing with a lot of actors that are getting paid quite a bit, it seemed only fitting that the series would come to an end not too long after the books came to an end, just because you kind of lose a little bit. Also, it's been kind of changed so much from the books that it's become its own thing, and unfortunately, it's not as popular except to the fans, the Trubies, that as it was when it first came out. Um, it kept its core audience, but it's not bringing any new numbers. It's not bringing in any new fans, really. Uh, it will be ten episodes long, and that'll be it. That'll be the end of the story of Suki Stackhouse. Um, this brings together, and this is huge spoilers, so you may want to turn me off for about... 30 seconds. Will Alexander Skarsgård be back? Because at the end of season six, it looked like he died. And that is horrible. Okay, so for those of you who have just come back, uh, no spoilers on this part, but it brings together rumors of who who will be back, who will live, and who will die. There is so much that can happen with it being the final season. These 10 episodes have to be the 10 best episodes ever, and they have to tie up as much as possible. Do not leave us with a Sopranos ending, please. All right, now some news that I don't really report on too much. I, I kind of leave the, the, these kind of stories for um, the Another Monday, the Another Podcast that airs on Monday, simply because... Um, I find these stories are definitely more suited for that show. Not that I can't report them. I definitely could. And I will. I am going to report this story. I just think that with all the things that I cover, it doesn't always fit in. So I could have passed it on, but 
Um, James has been hurting and hasn't been able to do uh, full podcasts. Hopefully that'll be back soon. Um, but he's been hurting, so instead of passing it on, I'm just going to say it. Sorry, James. I have to say it because I heard it and I couldn't believe it. And I was like, what? So here it is. Apparently, in the States, um, I believe in Oregon, yes, an Oregon teen called the police over a spider, or as she called it, a massive freaking spider. That's right. Apparently, a 911 recording has hit, and I will put it in the description below so you can listen to it yourself. It's kind of funny in a way. Um... A girl, teenage girl, calls. She's probably about 16, 17. She sounds about that, as you'll hear. Uh, the police to report a spider on the back of her couch. Now, you might think that the dispatcher would just be like, just kill it. Just don't worry about it. Well, apparently, they actually sent a cop out to dispose of the spider. Now, the official thing, they're saying that this is not protocol. We normally wouldn't respond to a call about spiders, but they decided to help out the young woman in this case. This is kind of weird to me. Like, seriously, you're spending taxpayers' dollars to send a cop out to kill a spider? Which, she was freaking out that it was huge? Yeah, the report came in that it was about two inches in diameter. Uh, I don't know about you. That's a big spider. Uh, for us Canadians, that's probably about as big as a toonie. For me, I'd, I'd freak the hell out. I'm, I'm afraid of spiders. At the same time, I don't think I'd be calling the cops to come and kill a spider. might call my girlfriend. I might call a friend. I might get my cat to chase it. But I'm not calling the cops to kill a spider. I might even kill it after I suited up and, you know, made sure that this thing wasn't getting near me. But... Seriously, calling the cops over a spider? Well, yep, this girl did, and not only did she did, did she do that, the cops actually showed up. Now, I keep having to scroll past the article, because they, they got a picture of somebody holding a massive spider, and I'm arachnophobic, so it kind of creeps me out. However, I will link the um, recording that was released, and you can give it a listen, and uh, maybe have a little bit of a laugh, and, and wonder why the U.S., well, at least not not all of the U.S., but why the Oregon Police Department actually dispatched a police officer to kill a spider. That is it for all the entertainment news this week. As I said, it was going to be a very short um, short show. However, I still have sports, and we'll get to that after the break. As usual, I like to take that little break because it gives my mouth a rest, gives me time to get something to eat or something to drink. Uh, in this case, I am actually doing a fantasy football draft. So it's sports related, but I have to do it. I have a time limit that I got to go and do this. So we're going to cut to a little break. Of course, you know what that break means. We're going to hear from Rob Chicato. Hi, I'm Rob Chicato, and you're listening to AnotherPodcast.com. Hi, I'm Rob Cicchetto, creator of Zombie Portraits. You can check out Zombie Portraits at zombieportraits.com. And we're back, and as always, that was Rob Cicchetto. And if you want to check out his work, check out zombieportraits.com. So, on to the sports section. I've had my little break. I've done my fantasy football draft, and we're on to the sports section, and we're going to start with football. And the NFL season kicks off tomorrow night, Thursday night, with a big matchup between the Baltimore Ravens and the Denver Broncos. I should say the defending Super Bowl champion Baltimore Ravens. Now, my personal take on this is, th is that Baltimore is just a little bit weaker than they were last year, and Denver's just a little bit stronger than they were last year. Uh, Baltimore lost Ray Lewis, obviously. They've lost Dennis Pitta to injury. They've lost other players to injuries, whereas... Uh, Denver, they have also lost players to injury. However, they added Wes Welker. They've got an up-and-coming tight end that they've just um, uh, added to their starting rotation, as it were. Uh, it is no longer uh, Driesen or uh, Tammy. It's... I uh, can't think of the guy's name right now, and I'm not going to look it up, because that would require too much work. Not really, but it's not that important. I just think that Denver has improved more than Baltimore has, and I think Baltimore is actually a weaker team for losing a guy like Ray Lewis just to begin with. Not that he was putting up the high numbers that he used to, but the fact that 
um, he was such a soul and team leader that it's to lose that is always big. So that's interesting there. So let's get into some statistics or some rankings, as it were. In this case, we're going to look at some of the quarterback rankings. Now, this is done by NFL.com, not a sponsor. Uh, they're ranking the t the top 30 or 25 no, wait, sorry. There's 32 teams, not 25 teams. I don't know what I was thinking. The top 32 quarterbacks going into the season and have them at different levels. So here's the five best of the best, as they're calling. They're ranking number one, Aaron Rodgers of the Green Bay Packers. Number two, Tom Brady of the New England Patriots. I think that's quite a bit high considering his young receiving core this year. Uh, number three, Peyton Manning, Denver Broncos. I think he should be actually number one this year. Drew Brees of the New Orleans Saints, number four, and with the return of Sean Payton, maybe a little higher. Ben Roethlisberger has to be the highest person on this list that doesn't, that, that kind of surprises me. Uh, obviously, he's of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, now, people say that he's been underrated in rankings and everything, but he's had injuries. He's had uh, issues in the past. He's still a decent quarterback. He's definitely a tough quarterback, and anybody, any team will be happy to have his skill set. I just don't know if he's a top five, but according to NFL.com, he's a top five. So the next level, this is ranking them 6 through 15 Number six on the list, Andrew Luck of the Colts. Number seven, Matt Ryan of the Falcons. Number eight, Russell Wilson of the Seahawks. I don't know if I'd rank him that high. As well as number nine, Colin Kaepernick of the San Francisco 49ers. Both these two quarterbacks still have something to prove to me. Joe Flacco is number 10 with the Baltimore Ravens. Robert Griffin III ranks number 11 of the Washington Redskins. Number 12, Eli Manning of the Giants. Even though he's won two Super Bowls, he's not even in the top 10. Tony Romo ranks 13th with the Dallas Cowboys. Seems a little high for him considering how much he chokes. Cam Newton of the Carolina Panthers is 14. And rounding out the next level at 15 is Jay Cutler of the Chicago Bears. And again, I think that might be a tad high. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. The reason why I say that's that high, because when we get to the mid-level, this is the ranking them from 15 to 25, and at, or sorry, 16 to 25, and at number 16, Matt Stafford of the Lions is ranked 16th behind guys like Colin Kaepernick, Russell Wilson, Joe Flacco, Robert Griffin III, Tony Romo, Jay Cutler. Are you serious? With his weapons, you got Megatron, Calvin Johnson, you've got Reggie Bush. The fact that he's ranked this low boggles my mind. Anyways, not my list, just reading what, I, what is written on NFL.com. And, you know, they are a little smart. They follow football a lot more than I do. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Matt Schaub is 17th of the Texans. Ryan Tannehill of the Dolphins ranked 18th. I think that's quite a bit high for him. Uh, Philip Rivers of the Philip Rivers of the Chargers, 19th. There's a guy that could be ahead of Tannehill. Here's another one. Michael Vick of the Eagles. Sam Bradford of the St. Louis Rams is 21st. Carson Palmer of the Arizona Cardinals is 22nd. 23rd is Andy Dalton of the Bengals. Probably another guy that could be ahead of Tannehill. Josh Freeman of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers probably should be a little bit lower. Alex Smith of the Kansas City Chiefs. I think this guy has a great opportunity here. He's going to a new city. He's got a new coach in uh, Andy Reid. He's got some weapons over there. I think Kansas City could be a team to watch out for. Now they play in a tough division, sort of. I mean, they have the, the Denver Broncos there. So Denver's going to be probably running away with that AFC West, but I don't know. Chiefs could make some waves. And the final category they rank from 26 to 32, the looking for development. Uh, looking to see improvement, and obviously there's going to be a rookie quarterback in here. From my Buffalo Bills, E.J. Manuel ranks 26th. Jake Locker is 27th for the Titans. Brandon Whedon of the Browns is 28th. 29th is Christian Ponder of the Vikings. Number 30, Geno Smith, New York Jets. Number 31, Terrell Pryor of the Oakland Raiders. And rounding out the 32 quarterbacks uh, projected to start this year, or at least week one, Blaine Gabbert of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, on the injury front, the New Orleans Saints have sent Jonathan Velma to the injured 
uh, able to return list or designated to return list, which means he is out for a minimum of seven weeks and will return in week eight. Um, he will not be IR'd unless uh, surgery or, or unless rehab doesn't go very well. Then he could be IR'd for the entire season, but they are hoping to have him back in the uh, mid-season range. Um, some depth chart notes, as I said when I was doing the the rankings for the quarterbacks, Geno Smith has actually beat out uh, Mr. S uh, franchise Sanchez, I don't know what you want to call him, but Mark Sanchez is no longer the starter, at least for now, in New York Jets territory. Their starter for week one will be Mr. Geno Smith, and it looks like Sanchez could be injured and might miss a few games, so Geno Smith may have to carry the workload. Also of note, it looks like uh, Levon, Le'Veon Bell, or however you say his name, uh, has actually moved back down the depth chart a little bit, and it looks like uh, Pittsburgh's backfield will be a committee approach once again. Isaac Redman looks like uh, he'll be starting... Um, against the Titans as the number one for now. This is going to be, uh, as I said, a committee approach. Le'Veon Bell will play, will not start. Uh, over in uh, New England, Rob Gronkowski has returned to practice, will probably not play week one, but should be back for week two, possibly as late as week three, but they're looking for week two. Zach Sudfeld is the rookie tight end that looks to be getting into the uh, situation in week one. Uh, the Dolphins this week have signed former Eagles offensive lineman Daddy Watkins uh, to help depth with the offensive line. And uh, the Buffalo Bills have an injured kicker, so they picked up Dan Carpenter. As a Bills fan, I am very disappointed that they couldn't find somebody else, and it sucks that we cut Lindell a little too early. Uh, it got him a job, but it lost us a kicker because uh, Hawker, Hop, Hopper, Hopker, I forget his name at the moment, got hurt, and Dan Carpenter is well known for missing very important kicks, something you don't want out of your kicker. So hopefully the injury uh, for the Buffalo Bills kicker is not that serious and won't require more than a, maybe a week or two of rest. Um, it just it sucks when you lose somebody this close to the season, but the Bills have lost so many players in preseason. It's unbelievable the injuries that have happened simply because – it was like almost like a, a downpour. As soon as Manuel got injured, it was like, wow, the injuries just piled up. I mean, losing the guy they signed, uh, Kevin Cobb, for the entire year. Um, they lost so many people. And it's Hopkins. I was I was close. Dustin Hopkins is the injured kicker. Um, it just, it, it's really tough. And he's missed so many kicks that it's just bad. Now, some... Weird news from the NFL. Apparently, Rex Ryan decided to miss cuts day, uh, which means, you know, being there for interviews and stuff like that for when they cut players to cut down to 53-man rosters because he went to see his son's game. Now, why is he taking flack with, for this? This makes absolutely no sense and shows you why the NFL is the no-fun league because... How could you take offense to this? This was awesome as far as a father is concerned. He did the right family choice. He put his family first. It wasn't like he absolutely positively needed to be there. And the fact that there's so much flack about it is just ridiculous. Also ridiculous, Tim Tebow wanting to be a quarterback in the NFL. Ever since he was cut by the New England Patriots, as uh, many suspected he would be, um, he has not had any interest from any other teams. Uh, he has publicly stated he will not play in Canada for the CFL, which is good because CFL don't want him. I'm sure there's probably teams that would try to work him. As long as this man wants to be a quarterback, he will never play again. If he can develop into some other kind of player, a running back or a tight end even, something other than a quarterback, maybe he makes an NFL uh team again however 
I have to agree with Ladanian Tomlinson, who uh, works on NFL Total Access, not a sponsor, who says basically he does not expect Tebow to play in the NFL again. I agree with that. I hope it's true. The guy was a horrible quarterback. Everybody says, well, he won this many games and he won pre He didn't win shit. He won those games because of Denver's strong, absolutely strong defense and some fluky offense. He didn't do anything in New York. He didn't do enough for the Patriots, who are known for bringing in uh, hard luck cases. He sucks. He's not a quarterback. He was fine in college. He was able to play the college game. You can't deny what he did in college. However, in the NFL, where it matters, he doesn't belong. Bye bye See you later. Come back never. That is it for the NFL news, so let's get right into the American League standings in baseball. Now, I've given up on the baseball season. However, I started doing it. I will go through until the World Series airs, but I am done with baseball for this year. With football starting tomorrow night, I am so happy to have football back. And in, in, in a month, I'll have hockey back, two sports that I absolutely love. In that time where hockey season ends in April, May, June, June-ish, after the playoffs are over, till right now, till September. So from June to September, it sucks for sports for me because soccer just got started back up again, so that's all right. But that's harder for me to watch because all the games are overseas and play at weird times. Uh, baseball, especially for me as a Jays fan where they're eliminated in April, usually mid-May, they're done. Um, everybody goes, oh, well, it's a long se season. No, it's not. When you play in the American League East, like the Jays do, if you do not come out strong and have a huge April and a very great May, you're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. I'm sorry, Jays fans. That's just the way it is. So with them being eliminated back in May, uh, it pretty much becomes a boring, long drive to get to football season. We are here. I will still continue the baseball news, so let's take a look at the American League standings. In the AL East, it is the Boston Red Sox leading with an 83-57 and record. In the Central, it is the Detroit Tigers leading with an 81-58 and record. In the West, we have a tie. The Oakland, Ra Oakland Rangers? No, that's football. Too much football on the brain. Oakland Athletics and the Texas Rangers have an identical 79-58 and record. Whichever one wins the division, the other one will win the top wildcard spot, whereas the second wildcard spot will go to the Tampa Bay Rays, currently right now anyways, at a 75-61 and record. Which makes me happy for the season we're in now because no Yankees in the playoffs would make me happy. National League, in the East, the Atlanta Braves lead with an 85-53 and record. The Central is led by the Pittsburgh Steelers, no, again, too much football in the brain. Pittsburgh Pirates with an 81 and 57 record, and over in the West it is the LA Dodgers with an 83 and 55 record. And your two wild card leaders at the moment are, and probably will remain, as between the two of them, there's only there's a seven and a half game lead over the third place team to run for that wild card. But it's the St. Louis Cardinals with a 79 and 59 record, and the Cincinnati Reds with a 78 and 61 record. So that's your standings. Let's take a look at some statistics, if I can get it out of my mouth. All right, the statistics. Your average leaders still Miguel Cabrera of the Tigers with a 358 batting average. Mike Trout of the Angels has, is batting 335. Chris Johnson of the Braves, 334. Michael Kadire of the Rockers batting 329. And Adrian Beltre rounds out the top five for the Rangers, batting 327. Your home run leaders, Chris Davis of the Orioles, still leading away with 47. Miguel Cabrera, hoping to catch him, he has he is of the Tigers, he has 43. Needs to overtake him if he wants to win the Triple Crown back-to-back -back years. Edwin Encarnacion of the Jays has 35 home runs. Pedro Alvarez of the Pirates has 32. Paul Goldschmidt rounds out the top five for the Diamondbacks with 31. Your RBIs leaders, Miguel Cabrera of the Tigers, still leading that one, 130 RBIs. Chris Davis of the Orioles, 122 RBIs. Paul Goldschmidt of the Diamondbacks has 104 RBIs. Edwin N. Canarcion of the Jays has 101 RBIs. And Brandon Phillips of the Reds has 99 RBIs. Your stolen bases leaders, Jacoby Ellsbury leading the way with 51 stolen bases. Rajay Davis of the Jays, 
has 40 stolen bases. Sorry, Jacoby Ellsbury plays for the Red Sox. Uh, Jean Segura of the Brewers has 39 stolen bases. Everest Cabrera, who's still on this list with 37 stolen bases of the Padres, as I mentioned many weeks ago, has been suspended for the rest of the year, but still there. Probably going to be knocked down within the next couple of weeks, and we won't have to say his name anymore. Uh, sorry, Everest, but you did use drugs. Performance-enhancing drugs, that is. Elvis Enders of the Rangers and Starling Marte of the Pirates, each with 35 stolen bases. Over to the pitching side of things. Uh, your ERA, ERA leader is Clayton Kershaw of the Dodgers with a 1.89 ERA. Matt Harvey of the Mets still with a 2.27 ERA, but as I said, could be done for the year depending on how he's rehabbing that injury. They're hoping he comes back, but we'll have to wait and see still. Jose Fernandez of the Marlins has a 2.33 ERA. And uh, as my cat knocks things over, I'll continue on. Um, Annabelle Sanchez of the Tigers has a 2.68 ERA, and Yu Darvish of the Rangers rounds out the top five with a 2.73 ERA. Your pitching win leaders, Max Scherzer of the Tigers still sitting on 19, looking for that 20th win of the season again this week. And then we have Jorge De La Rosa of the Rockies, Francisco Lariano of the Pirates, Chris Tillman of the Orioles, Adam Wainwright of the Cardinals, and Jordan Zimmerman of the Nationals, all with 15 wins. Your strikeout leaders, still Hugh Darvish of the Rangers with 236, Clayton Kershaw of the Dodgers, and Max Scherzer of the Tigers, each with 201. Felix Hernandez crosses the Magic 200 number of the Mariners with 200, and Chris Sale of the White Sox has 193. Your saves leaders, Craig Kimbrell of the Braves has 43 saves, Jim Johnson of the Orioles has 41, Mariano Rivera of the Yankees has 39. Wouldn't it be fitting if Mariano Rivera finishes the season with only 42 saves to match his number? Now, I think I don't think that would happen because that means he's only going to get three more saves the rest of the way. And let's see. Let's just take a quick look. The Yankees have played 138 games, which means they still have 24 games left. Only three saves in 24 games would seem a little low. So I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it would be cool if it did. Anyways, moving on. Joe Nathan of the Rangers has 38 saves, and Greg Holland rounds out the top five of the Kansas City Royals with 37 saves. That is your statistics for this week. That is the end of this show this week. I know I said it would be a short one, and it is. We're under an hour once again, uh, which is fine. I mean, when the news is there, we get the extended show. If I get guests, we get the extended show. Still working on things for from Fan Expo, for those of you who are wondering about that. Um, the audio is not as great as I would have hoped. I'm hoping to tweak that a little bit. So look, stay tuned for that. As I said, as soon as I get that going, that will be put up as a special, if not part of the show proper. That is it for this week. I am out. Remember... Listen to the podcast on anotherpodcast.com. That's E-H-N-O-T-H-E-R podcast.com. You can find us on iTunes. Also find us on Stitcher.com. You can look for old episodes on YouTube, and you can find the links to that below. And if you like it, come back, listen every week. Also, like the face Facebook page, because you know what? I post it there every time an episode goes up. It goes up on the Facebook page, so you know every time a new episode comes out. Listen, listen, listen. Subscribe, even. You know, we always like the good listeners. Tell your friends. Get them to listen. Maybe they enjoy the show. I hope they enjoy the show. I enjoy doing it. And as long as I enjoy doing it, I'll keep doing it. So remember, come back every week. I'll be here every week, hopefully. And who knows? One day I'll be coming to you from the Green Emerald Isle of Ireland. I'm going to visit my girlfriend in November. And I'll be doing the podcast from there. Won't that be awesome? Well... You guys won't really know, but I will. Have another great week, and come back. I hope you come back. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm out. Thanks for listening to Another Podcast from AnotherPodcast.com. Don't forget to go on iTunes and or download right from AnotherPodcast.com. That's E-H-N-O-T-H-E-R, podcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Another Podcast. Be sure to check back for tomorrow's show only on Another Podcast, your Canadian podcast network. Anotherpodcast.com, not a sponsor.